Thanks, Kathy. Um, I, I want to thank the library also for doing this because it's, uh, it's the second time I've done this. Uh, they had me for my first book, and it was pretty uh, generous of them to do that. Um, I feel like I'm getting the better end of the bargain because I've lived in Wellesley for 20 years, and I come to the library at least once a week, probably more. So do the math. It's like a thousand times I've been here, and uh, they have me here twice to do this. This is fabulous. I, uh, it's a great facility. We're lucky. We're lucky we have it, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thanks to all you guys for coming tonight. Um, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> I uh, didn't know you were coming. That's great. Um, I know it's Thursday night in Boston, so you guys have other stuff you could have been done, could have been doing or doing. So I'm uh, I'm happy that you're here, and hopefully it'll be worthwhile to listen to me for however long I talk. Um, you know, they they said it's a reading, so that would make it about five minutes because I could just read from a chapter and we'd be done. So I think I'm supposed to do something else too. Um, I thought a lot about what it is. I've done these kind of things before, and also with this book, um, you know, I was fortunate to get a great review, and then I got asked to do a lot of radio interviews. I did about 25, I think it was, and you get used to the same questions coming, and uh, I know the, probably the number one question is, how did you go from being a lawyer to being a writer? Um, despite the fact there's a lot of lawyers out there that are writing books. Uh, they ask that question, and um, they also ask, because of the bio, there's other stuff I taught and did other things. So I thought, a lot of you guys know me, so you already know this story, but for those who don't, I'll tell you a little bit how I got to be here. Um, as Kathy mentioned, from upstate New York, central New York, great place to live, great place to grow up, um, and I, you know, Played sports and did all the things a kid usually does, but I also like to read. You know, that was, I don't know how it came about, but just as a kid, I'd, you know, come in from playing sports and I'd go to my room and read, and I just loved it. I remember being fascinated by the idea that somebody could write a book. This whole thing they made up out of thin air. How'd they do that? And uh, I even have a memory, this is crazy, I have a memory of picking up a book at one point and thumbing through it and I stopped at, I don't know, page 149, whatever it was, and I said, how'd they know to put those words on that page? <laughs> <laughs> Which only reveals how little I knew about writing then. <laughs> but I found out the answer later on. Um, but it was just the, the magic of the idea that they could create something that would turn out like this and it would influence people. They would read it and, and be influenced by it. Um, you know, I read all the... Standard books, I don't want to age myself here in front of you guys, but most of you know how old I am, but you know, Catcher in the Rye, A Separate Piece, Lord of the Flies, loved them all, but probably the book that made me want to be a writer the most was To Kill a Mockingbird, which probably doesn't shock anybody. It's a pretty uh, amazing book. Uh, to this day, it remains the only book that when I finished it, I turned around and went back to page one and read it again. Uh, never done that before. Not before and not since. But, you know, Harper Lee, again, you know, the magic of creating a world like that, and look how much she's influenced the world. It's, I don't know, maybe the great American novel, if there is such a thing. Um, so it made me want to do it. <laughs> and, you know, you grow up, and then you go to college, and you think, okay, well, you know, you want to be a writer. You go to college, you'll be a writer, and it didn't work out that way. Part of the reason was I was a terrible writer. <laughs> I was not a good writer. I, I did well in school. You know, I did well in the SATs. I got into a good college, Syracuse, right? But I, I had a, a huge insecurity about writing and my writing. In fact, at school, I would try to avoid registering for courses where I knew you had to write papers. That's how bad it was. Uh, but I got through. Uh, until law school, anyway, because you get to law school and you can't help but write. One of the first things they do is they enroll you in a class called Legal Research and Writing, which is just what it says it is. 
research, and then you have to do a lot of writing. And I remember the first time I got a paperback from my TA, I was taught by teaching assistants, third year law students, and it was covered in red, like a crime scene photo. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said to me, you really got to learn how to write if you want to stay in law school. Pick up Strunk and White, Elements of Style. And I did. And I literally taught myself to write that year. Because uh, he told me how important it was, and it was. He also said, judges have to read a lot. So when you write for judges, you want to make it real easy for them. So don't make it complicated when you write. Make it really easy to read. So I took his advice, and that's always stuck with me. I just, uh, that's how I write. Um, and it's not irony, but coincidence, I don't know. Related somehow, I became one of those TAs my third year, and I taught legal research and writing. So it, in that course of those years, that's what happened. That's, that's really when I learned to be a writer. And then I graduated from school, and my first job out of law school was a clerkship. I don't know if you guys know what a clerkship is. It's you work for a court, and you do research for judges, and you help them write opinions. You gotta, you gotta write. So there I was doing writing again. I did that for a couple of years and then I got a job here in Boston at a big firm. And um, I was in a department, in the appellate department, where you had to research and write. So I was writing constantly. Um, all the while harboring the ambition to still be a writer of things like this. And so while I was practicing, I actually wrote a couple novels. The first one, just to see if I could figure out what to put on page 149, uh, and just to see if I could do it. And then the second one, I, I thought, you know, this isn't bad. I, this is pretty good. This could actually get published. And I got an agent in New York City. This is a long time ago now. This is before computers and the internet and email and all this stuff. And I, I got an agent, and she thought it was great. She thought I was going to be the next Jay McInerney. Anybody remember Jay McInerney? Yeah, yeah. Bright Lights, Big City. Right? Um, my book was a fictional journal from a high school senior in western Massachusetts, a football player. Um, set in 1969. His first entry in the journal was the day after the Woodstock Music Festival. Mm -hmm. And the last entry was the day after Kent State. Mm -hmm. And you may not remember back then, depending on how old you are, but a lot of stuff happened in that nine months. In the month preceding Woodstock, three things alone you had. Man on the Moon, Chappaquiddick, and the Manson murders, all in that same month. Then you had all kinds of stuff happening. Um, you know, the draft lottery, and I don't mean football, I mean Vietnam. You had the Beatles breaking up, you had all kinds of stuff happening. And it was about how all the events of that time uh, particularly the war, uh, not only affected him, but his family. It was, I thought it was a pretty good book, and so did she. So she sent it to all the editors that uh, had read McInerney's book, and it didn't get published. And I learned the first lesson of writing, which is rejection, which you got to live with because it's part of it. So um, I, it's funny, I have a friend from high school who read it, and he keeps calling me and goes, you can put that out now, can't you? And I said, nah, it's, it's old, nobody will care. Um, but I'm proud of having written it, but I continued to practice law. I had my own practice then. Uh, I also taught law um, at BC in the undergraduate school, business school. Um, and I met a guy, became friends with him while I was practicing law. He was my real estate broker for our office to help us find our new office. And somehow I mentioned to him I had written a novel, and he said, can I read it? So I gave him that book, and he read it, and he said, do you ever think about writing screenplays? And, and yeah, sure. <laughs> I said, want to write a screenplay? So we did. Took a detour. It's writing, but it's not novels. And uh, we didn't know what to do with it. Again, back then, there's no internet, there's no email. You know, nowadays, it's like every kid in America wants to write screenplays. We had a screenplay, we didn't know what to do with it. What do you do? You just you know, mail it to Hollywood? <laughs> it turned out the Massachusetts Film Office had a, uh, a screenwriting competition. It was the second year they had it. It was to promote filmmaking in 
Massachusetts. So it had to have something to do with Massachusetts, and coincidentally, ours did. It was all set in Massachusetts. <coughs> and if you won the competition, they flew you to Los Angeles, put you up in a nice hotel, and set you up with meetings with all the agents. <coughs> and we didn't win, but we came in second. And I went to the film office and said, we'll pay for the flight in the hotels. Can you get us those meetings? And they said, sure. And so we went out to LA and we had all kinds of meetings with people and they said, this is great. We can't do anything with it. Write something else. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what Hollywood says. And we did. And that one sold. Big, huge. Changed my life. Um, and I always joke. For four months, we were the hottest writers in Hollywood. <laughs> about four months, about from August to maybe January. Everybody knew who we were. Everybody wanted to meet with us. Um, and, uh, you know, again, rejection, they didn't make the movie. A lot of people don't realize that, and this was then, it's worse now, it's much worse now, but then Hollywood made fewer than one out of 20 properties that they owned, whether that's a screenplay or the rights to a book or a magazine article. So every meeting we ever went to, we'd be in an office and there'd be just scripts stacked up everywhere and you think, they own all those, they're not going to make any of them. <laughs> and you learn pretty quickly that's the business. And I continued to write and I was teaching at BC and I decided, you know, now I'm not practicing law anymore. I shouldn't be teaching law. You know, I'm putting a suit on every day to teach and I'm doing practice anymore. And I knew that BC had a, a film department, really small, so I wandered over one day and said, do you have anybody teaching screenwriting? They said, no, do you want to do it? <laughs> and I literally was hired on the spot. <laughs> and it went from one course the first semester to four. And I founded the screenwriting program there in the film department and did that for 11 years. And wrote other screen plays, none of which got made. It's just the, the bane of my existence. Um, but I also, like a lot of professors, I wrote a book about what I was teaching. And I wrote a book about uh, writing screenplays. Uh, in particular, there were a few out there then. There's a billion now. But it was about writing the ending of a screenplay. Because the ending is the most important part of the movie, isn't it? If you don't like the end, you don't like the movie. Um, and I had developed some theories about it, so I wrote a book about it. And it, as Kathy mentioned, I got published. And um, ironically, that got me noticed in Hollywood more because they had forgotten about me from when I was hot for four months. <laughs> and uh, probably the best thing that came out of that was an email I got one day. I remember Suzanne coming in to get me to dinner's ready. And I'm looking at this email on the computer. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading this email. And she said, well, what's it say? And I said, this woman's writing to me. And she said, my boss read your book really likes it, he wants to meet you and talk with you. She didn't say who her boss was. <laughs> so I looked at the bottom and, you know, the signature on the email, and it was from a company called Overbrook Entertainment. And I knew that Overbrook Entertainment was the production company of Will Smith, who was the hottest actor in Hollywood at the time. And I thought, okay, one of my friends is messing with me here, because this can't <laughs> be right. But it said call, so I called, and sure enough, that's what it was. And eventually, I'll cut the story short. Um, you know, I met with them and met with Will and was hired to um, work on about a dozen projects over two years uh, with him. Even went to his house in Utah at Sundance time and worked there with people. They never made that movie either, and he was Will Smith and could get any movie made he wanted. <laughs> and he would bat about one out of ten, mm -hmm. believe it or not. That's how crazy that business is. Um, but that was, listen, that was a, a huge thing. Um, and, you know, I kept on writing. Well, I, didn't, I stopped writing screenplays at that point. I was trying to produce them with, uh, from people I knew in Hollywood. And then I had an idea to write a novel, go back to what I started out wanting to do, which was write novels. Because I had this idea, and I thought, Look, I learned something from teaching screenwriting. Not every idea is a screenplay. It should be a novel, not a screenplay, depending on the story. So I had this idea, 
And one of the questions I always get asked in radio interviews is, where do you get your ideas? Hmm. Well, this idea was with me forever. Uh, probably, well, not forever, 20 years. So let's start there. I, I, th I was out of law school. It was the 80s, and that little small town I told you about, that you guys know about, um, a boy went missing from the municipal swimming pool and was found drowned three days later in the pool. They found him in the deep end under the diving board, 15 feet under. And the first thing everybody thought was foul play, right? It's three days to find the guy. They had big searches everywhere. They went everywhere. They couldn't find him. Turned out, no, he actually drowned in the pool. He got sucked up against the filter down there at the bottom. He was small. It was murky. I actually know the cop that found him. They were going to drain the pool, and he said, let me take one more dive. They kept diving looking for him, and he found him. And it turned out he actually did. And when they told me this story, I wasn't living there anymore. Somebody told me the story. That's all I knew about it. I didn't know the kid's name. I didn't know anything. I thought, what if it was foul play? That's a, that's a story. Who would put a kid in the pool and why? And so I had that idea, and then I had another idea, and I combined the two, which I thought was clever until I found out that Stephen King wrote a book called On Writing, and the way Stephen King does everything, he combines two or three ideas. But anyway, I combined it with another idea, which was a rumor I heard when I was a kid, when I was 12, that in a certain part of town, the western end of town, um, somebody came up to me and said, boy, you don't want to go in the cornfields behind West Main Street in the summer because there are adults back there doing stuff. You know what I mean. Hijinks. Hmm. You know, like, use your imagination. And I thought, wow, what if that were true? It scared the hell out of me. You know, first time you hear sex at 12, you get excited. Then you hear the other hijinks. Oh, no. And I thought, what if that was true? Combine that with a dead boy in a pool, you got a story. So that was my first book, uh, my first novel, In the Matter of Michael Vogel. It's upstairs. <laughs> it's for sale. Um, and... Um, when I wrote it, I love murder mysteries and thrillers, but one of the things I don't like is just the standard rote, alcoholic cop, divorced, has to solve the crime. And, you know, it's great the first 200 times you read it. I didn't <laughs> want to do that. So I decided to tell the story with three narrators. Uh, one was a sheriff who wasn't an alcoholic, but... In his past, he had made a mistake, and a kid died. So he really wanted to solve this crime for redemption. Um, the second narrator was a 12-year-old boy who didn't witness the crime, but he knew something about it, enough that it would have helped the police, but also enough that it would have caused those people who killed those boys to come after him, so he was trying to keep it quiet. And the third narrator was a 40-year-old a bachelor, relatively new to town, who had a secret. And so anyway, I wrote the book, and um, it came out four years ago. I was fortunate to get good reviews. Um, I found out Kirkus was going to review it. Kirkus, along with Publishers Weekly, one of the top review services there is, and they say the hardest. So I was excited when I heard they were going to do it, and then all of a sudden I panicked, because <laughs> what if it's a bad review? Uh, it turned out to be a good review, and it really helped. And So anyway... Uh, in the matter, Michael Vogel was, you know, pretty successful. Uh, for a time, it was one of the highest-rated historical thrillers uh, on Amazon. Uh, for a brief time, it was a bestseller in their Kindle store. Um, and, you know, I thought, eh, maybe that's it. That's all I'll do. I wrote, I wrote one. I'm good. And then I had an idea for this one. Same thing, I combined two things. I won't tell you because if you haven't read it, it'll give away stuff, but I had two ideas. I put them together. Um, and I thought, let me give it another shot. Let me write another one. And uh, so I wrote this. Um, let me read the back for those of you who don't know the book. I'll tell you a little bit what it's about. A simple list, 12 names, none familiar. 
When an elderly small town doctor dies, his widow contacts his most famous former patient, a noted author and neuroscientist. It seems the doctor has left him something, a list of names, a mystery of sorts, one that the doctor has taken great pains not to explain, but one that he feels the scientist alone can solve. What starts out as a lukewarm promise to honor the doctor's dying wish soon turns into a race halfway across the country to find out what those names have in common for the two men who have de demanded the return of that list can stop them using any means necessary. So that's what it's about. Um, I tell people in all those interviews, I told them, you know, how do you do this? How do you write? What is that? And I said, you know, where do you get your ideas? I said, well, the first 20 pages of this book came to me in a flash, basically. I don't mean the actual writing, but all the events of the first 20 pages just came to me. It was the easiest thing I ever wrote because I knew it instinctively. Um, and I've been fortunate. This has gotten good reviews, and I was notified that this one was going to get reviewed by Publishers Weekly, the other review service. And again, the same thing. Oh, I'm all excited. Oh, shit. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, what if they don't like it? Uh, and then I found out they really liked it, and I got a starred review, which is it's the coveted starred review, because, I don't know, maybe 10% of the books they review get a starred review. So that was pretty uh, reassuring and uh, rewarding. So got a lot of good customer reviews as well. Although I looked on Goodreads the other day and somebody gave me a one-star rating. Hmm. That's always fun to see. It's like, what? <laughs> she said, I don't believe all the other reviews on here. And there's like 30 others that are four and five star. It's like, okay. <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> um, anyway, so this is normally when you read the excerpt from the book. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I name all the chapters in the book. They all have names. Um, this is the third chapter. It's called Men in Suits. I just about reached the ramp that would take me onto the highway when my cell phone rang and I hit the talk button. It was the widow, again. You need to come back, she said. I found something else. There was an urgency to her voice that wasn't there when we spoke just a few minutes earlier, causing me to pull over to the other side of the road. What is it, she said, I asked. She paused for a beat. I'd rather not say over the phone, she said. You need to see for yourself. With all due respect, Mrs. Condon, I think I have... The line went dead before I could finish, so I hit call back. The phone rang four times and then went to voicemail. Only it wasn't her on the recording. It was her husband, which was jarring. I hadn't heard the man's voice in almost 30 years, and to do so right after attending his funeral seemed slightly surreal. Of course, she wouldn't have thought of changing it yet. I imagined that she wasn't picking up because she thought that avoiding me would make it more likely that I'd go along with her request. If so, she was right. I couldn't help but think that she had just lost her husband and had left her with some strange kind of task after most likely suffering the beginning stages of dementia. As much as I didn't want to go back, I felt no small degree of sympathy for her and decided I would go see what she had to show me. Then I'd tell her that I really need to get back home to attend to my own affairs and I'd turn off my phone as soon as I left to avoid any further manipulation. It was only as I pulled onto her street that I wondered how they, she got my cell phone number. I parked in the same space as I did earlier. Like then, the street was empty. I walked onto the porch, knocked on the door just as I did before. However, unlike the last time, it didn't open immediately. I waited there for about 20 seconds more and then knocked again, only this time louder. Once more, I waited and no one came. So I walked down the wraparound porch to where the living room window was and shaded my eyes to look in. The house appeared to be empty. I tapped on the window, hoping that maybe a different sound would cause her to come to the front. When it didn't, I took out my phone and dialed her number. I could hear it ring inside. I could also see the old-fashioned wall phone hanging in the kitchen near the doorway to the living room. No one approached it. I let it ring until the recording came on again, and then I hung up. My heart started beating a little faster as the thought entered my mind that something might not be right. I went back and tried the door and I found it locked. When I lived in that town, no one locked their doors when they were home. Most never locked them at all, even when they were away on vacation. 
Crime was never much of an issue back then, and I wondered if things might have changed since I left. I stepped off the porch and hurried up the driveway and around to the small landing at the back. I knocked on the door there and didn't have any more luck in getting a response. I tried the handle then, and to my surprise, the door clicked open. After taking a few seconds to decide whether to enter, I took a couple of cautious steps inside, leaving the door open behind me. I called out the widow's name. All I heard in response was the loud ticking of the grandfather clock I'd seen when I was in there before. I looked around to get my bearings and then proceeded down the hallway that I thought might lead me to the doctor's study. I was right. From a few feet away, I could see the door to the room was slightly ajar. I approached it slowly, cringing at the squeaks from the hardwood floor. When I got there, I pushed it all the way open and peered in. The widow was laying there on the floor, arms splayed out and her eyes open but lifeless. I took a step toward her to see if there was any chance that she might still be breathing. When I did, I caught sight of two men standing stiffly against the wall to my left, some eight feet away. One was tall and slim and looked to be in his late 50s or early 60s, older than me anyway. The other was of medium height and weight and considerably younger, no more than 30. Both wore dark suits and latex gloves, the kind dentists wear when they don't want to risk an infection. Or, when criminals, or criminals when they don't want to leave any fingerprints. The taller one said my name in a soft and calm voice, almost as if we were old friends. I froze there in the doorway. If you'll just give us those papers she gave you, we'll let you leave and forget about all this, he said. Neither he or the other man made a move toward me. Given the widow's dead body on the floor, I didn't exactly believe him. What happened to her, I asked. Looks like a heart attack, the younger one said with a slight smile. Probably from the grief. You'd be surprised at how often it happens. The gloves alone revealed the absurdity of that statement, but I chose not to respond. That list, the older one said? Sure, I said. For about three seconds, I didn't make a move, and neither did they. Then the younger one took a step toward me, and I reacted, backing through the door and pulling it shut as I did. Then I turned and ran through the kitchen. As I did, I heard the sound of them coming out behind me. I was out the open back door, slamming it shut and around to the front of the house in no time. I didn't bother looking back until I was at my car and pulled open the door on the driver's side. When I did, there was no one in the driveway. However, as I got in and closed the door, I could see a face in the living room window I had peeked into moments before. It was the older of the two men. He shook his head as if he was disappointed about something. I pulled the car out of the parking spot and punched it. As I did, I saw a boy who appeared to be about 10 or 11 years old standing astride a bicycle on the sidewalk across the street from the widow's home. We made eye contact for about a second, and then I looked away. As I turned the corner at the end of the street, I wondered if someone that young would be capable of memorizing a license plate. By the time I had made it onto the interstate, I convinced myself that even if he could, he would have had no reason to log my plate number since he had no way of knowing that the widow was dead when he saw me. There was nothing suspicious about me getting into my car and driving away even that speed, at that speed. He would probably find out about the widow soon enough, but it was unlikely that he'd be able to think back and recall my plate. Under that scenario, no one would, regardless of how old they were. Nevertheless, I continued to check the rearview mirror all the way back to Connecticut and what I hoped was the relative safety of my condominium. Um, a couple things. This is when you can ask questions if you want. I'll try to answer them. Um, and also books are for sale. Um, normally $15, $10 tonight, and all proceeds to the library. So, um, Kevin? I have a question here. Uh, love the book. Read it, loved it. Um, you mentioned um, that the most important part of any screenplay is, is the ending. Yeah. And you said the first 20 pages came to you just very, very yep. easily. Um, when did you arrive at an ending? Was it really at the end of writing? Or was it sooner and then you did a little back writing and you kind of wrote that and then worked back? Great question. The way, you know, when you write screenplays, you're supposed to know your ending. And what that really means, people think you're supposed to know every aspect of your ending. You're really only supposed to know what, not how. So with this, I knew what the ending was. I knew exactly what was going to happen in terms of the narrator, but I didn't know how. And in fact, this has had 
four separate endings, um, including one sixth sense kind of surprise ending hmm. that the agent loved that I didn't. I like this one. This was my favorite. Um, so yeah, I had to really work hard on this ending, and it was the how, not the what. The what remained the same, the how changed. And so, yeah, I had a back right. It changed things in other parts of the book. You know, Kevin writes books, he's a writer. You know you gotta change things if you change something at the end, so. Um, good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, what makes a, why did you decide a novel rather, rather than a screenplay? Because it sounds very cinematic just from your reading. <laughs> yeah, people say that. Uh, this one, I could have written as a screenplay. Still could. Hollywood's interested. Um, the difference between novels and screenplays basically is this. Novels are internal. And you can talk directly to your reader. And you can tell them what your characters are thinking. You can go back, backstory very easily. You can spend a lot of time. Plus, there's a lot of freedom in terms of size. With a screenplay, it's two hours which is 120 pages tops. Um, and it's only what you can see and hear. You can't, you don't get characters' thoughts. You only know their thoughts from what they tell you or don't tell you. And there's other tricks you can use as a screenwriter to get what a character's thinking. In a novel, you can do it. So if your story is mostly narration or going to be internal, which is why in The Matter of Michael Vogel I wrote as a novel because it's three narrators, all who have these internal struggles and stories, it's not going to come out well in a movie. It could be done, definitely. It would take work. Um, but I knew that was a novel. This could have been a screenplay. Still could be. Uh, because it's, um, there's a lot of action. There's a lot of stuff going on. But there's still an eternal aspect to this, and I like that. You know, and a novel can go on forever. If anybody's read A Gentleman from, Mos from Moscow, it's like 100, what is it, 500 pages? You know, it doesn't have to be 120 pages, right? It doesn't have to be 200 pages. Screenplay is very rigid. So um, this one could have been a, a screenplay, but I just chose, since I'd written Michael Vogel and I really enjoyed the process, I thought I'd give it another shot. Set aside a certain verse, just when it, sort of the thoughts come to you. Um, it's uh, yeah, you have to have a routine. Somebody asked me before. Six a.m. Walk the dog. <laughs> <laughs> walk right by Jonathan's house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I would treat it like a job. I'd sit down at the desk the same time every day, and put in eight hours. Um, so yeah, I would have to have I, that. That was how I did it. What was the first part? And how long? How long? Oh, yeah. Uh, depending on what else you're doing. Like when I was teaching, it took a little bit longer for Michael Vogel. Um, it's about a year to do a first draft. But then you've got to write multiple drafts after that. You've got to fix it. All the good stuff comes out in the rewrites. So that takes at least another year. So this took two years. Because I was pretty much just doing this at the time. So I think it took about two years. So Drew, when you're doing your, your drafting and your redrafts, when, when do you get to a point where you actually feel comfortable sharing it with other people? Never. <laughs> uh, no, you, you, at some point you have to let it go. You just realize, I am done. This, I can't do any better if they don't like it. And here's the thing, this is weird, but I don't read them after they're published. Because, I mean, that was awkward enough, what I was doing, because I want to change the words. Or I want to add things. You're never done. Ever. So, you know, at some point, you, you just, i got to share it. I just, just see what people think. But it sounds like you don't share it until you feel like you're done with it. Yeah. Oh, you'd never show a first draft to anybody. Right. I wouldn't show it to Suzanne. I would never show a first draft to anybody. Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway calls it the vomit draft. Called it. He's dead. Um, 
and it's graphic, but it's true. You just throw everything out there, and then you say, I'll fix it later. Yeah. So, yeah. That, you definitely don't show that. It, it's probably three drafts at least before you say, okay, I could show this to somebody. And, yeah. Jonathan? Uh, the Kindle version that I bought had a great discussion guide at the back. Yeah. I don't know if the yeah. book does. Yeah. And the first question I thought was interesting, the, the lead character does not get a name. Nope. How difficult was that? Very. Yeah, I get to ask that. I got asked that in every radio interview I did. It's an unnamed narrator. Several characters are not named. Some are, some are. There's a reason. Um, and I say it was both accidental and intentional. Accidental in the sense that when I wrote the first 20, 30 pages, I realized I haven't given this guy a name yet. This is weird. Uh, I've given other people names. I haven't given him names. Why am I doing that? And I thought, uh, I'm, I write on gut and instinct, so I thought, there's a reason I'm doing that. I'm not going to mess with it. Let me see how far I can go. And I finally got into a rhythm realizing, okay, there's points when someone could say his name, but I'll, I can get around that. And I did it intentionally. And there's a reason why I don't give him or I don't tell you his name or other characters' names, but I'm not going to tell you why. <laughs> I'd much rather have people wonder and ask me. Um, but, yeah, I did. It, it's... It was just instinct, and I got it done, and I, it felt right. Yeah. Drew, do you have an idea for uh, another another novel? I have a vomit draft <laughs> in the drawer. Yeah, yeah, it's sitting there. It's going to sit there for a while, I think. I don't know. It's a lot of work, boy. I got to tell you, it's a lot of work. The first draft is less work than the rewrites because the rewrites, and I have pads of yellow paper that I have to write notes on, have to change this, have to change that, put it at the page, then you get, man. If it wasn't for search and replace now, and we're doc, I don't know how, because you have to search things and make sure that there's continuity. Um, but yeah, I have another idea but and a draft, but I'm not quite ready to tackle that these days. But at least... So you have four endings to this story. Would you ever use one of the other ones for a screenplay? No, this would be it. This is exactly what I wanted it to do. Exactly. And you know how I got to this one? I used a, a screenwriting technique, which it involves talking it out. But usually in screenwriting, you talk it out to your writing partner or to your somebody. I did it literally with myself and my iPhone. I took the recorder out. And I talked to myself, went in the basement, turned off the lights, and I talked to myself and talked about all the things that were wrong and what I could do. And the reason talking always works when you're a screenwriter is someone will say something and it'll trigger an idea. So I might not have triggered the idea when I said something, but when I went back and listened, it would trigger an idea. And I got to the point where everything I wanted to happen happened the way I wanted it to. Ultimately, I have, I don't know, I think there's six recordings on here, six sessions of that. So, yeah, I would stick with this one. Hollywood, on the other hand, would do whatever they wanted, so wouldn't have any control of that. So would they know about the other endings? If they asked me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They'd probably want the same stupid one the agent wanted, <laughs> which would ruin the story, I think. What were your insecurities as a young writer when you were in college? What was so bad about your writing? I just, I didn't think it was any good. I just, I don't know why. I just, uh, I probably was good enough, obviously, to, you know, do okay in the SATs and get into school, but I just didn't feel like I was a good writer. Maybe because I admired writers so much and their stuff was so good, I just didn't think I was a good writer. And <laughs> I love to blame my 10th grade English teacher because that was the year when they taught you strunk and white and all the rules of grammar and everything. And I was in a class, I was in an advanced class, and they gave us experimental English that year mm. with sentence trees and roots and all these things. And I don't remember any of it, but it wasn't any of what 
Strunk and Wright tells you at all, which is why I hate experimental education. <laughs> I hate it. But yeah, I, it was really miraculous. I, I'd never read Strunk and Wright. If it wasn't for that TA, I wouldn't be standing here. He said, you got to learn to write, get here, you're never getting out of school. And I, you know, just taught myself to write and made it kind of readable and simple and just learned the simple rules of grammar. You know, when to use a semicolon, you know, simple as that. So your, your, your punctuation was, was terrible? Awful. Your, your spelling? What was your spelling was okay. I was always good at spelling. But my punctuation was right. Just dependent clauses, things like that, run-on sentences, just, yeah, bad. Really bad. And I don't, I thankfully, don't have any samples of my early writing. So, <laughs> so you say, so vomit, drowning, and then I'm, I'm wondering with um, um, To Kill a Mockingbird, so do you think The Watchman, her follow-up, was Harper Lee's vomit draft? Yep. <laughs> I'm convinced. They waited till she died, mm -hmm. and they waited till her sister died. Her sister was a lawyer and her protector, mm -hmm. and she had died, and that's when they did it. I think it was the first thing she wrote. She wrote that before yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird, and her editor told her, no, no, the kids, the kids are the story. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm so sorry I read it. Yeah. It changed the view of Atticus, that's for sure. Yeah. Also changed the view of uh, Scout. Yeah, Scout too. Yeah, absolutely. But Atticus is so iconic, my yeah. God. Yeah. So do, do you ever think about doing any legal thrillers? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, that's a good question. People ask me that because it's natural, right? No, I don't because... I didn't do enough trial work, which is, those are always the interesting ones. So I didn't do enough to make it, you know, I did civil stuff. It was crazy stuff. You know, guy fails a drug test and gets fired. <laughs> What's <laughs> about that? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've thought about it and I thought I'd fail miserably. You know, leave that to Tarot and Grisham and those guys. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of lawyers. Are you attracted to a specific genre, or are you just going to Yeah, expect mysteries, thrillers. But like I say, I, I like them with some half, like I love, I don't know if anybody's ever read Tana French, Irish writer. Oh, my God. Jesus, she's good. She, uh, she writes mysteries with characters, and she goes so deep into the characters, they're fantastic. Um, I like a guy named Alan Glynn, also Irish, who writes corporate thrillers. They're really smart, really good. So I like thrillers and mysteries, but I'm on to have something different about them which is what made me write mine the way I did. Not naming a narrator, having three narrators from the other book, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, but I read everything. Gentleman in Moscow is not a mystery, although every book is a mystery, really, if you think about it. I mean, why is he in this hotel? What's going to happen? Um, Rules of Civility, which I loved even more than Gentleman in Moscow. Uh, it's really a mystery. Who's the guy in the photograph in the subway? Did you read it? Tim, it's great. It's a great book. So, yeah, I like all good books, but I tend to be drawn to, you know, thrillers and mysteries. I got a follow-up to that. Uh, do you think that the books people write or read says anything about them? If, they, if they're attracted, drawn to anything in particular? They read serial killer books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, yeah, I think it does say something. It's... I have friends who won't read any fiction that all they read is nonfiction. They'd, they'd be bored out of their mind reading my book or any other piece of fiction. And then I have, yeah, I, I pretty much shied away from nonfiction, although these days I've been reading more of it. Like when I, somebody can really tell a story like Eric Larson, you know, he's in the Garden of Beasts and all that stuff. He's a great writer. Um, so I think it does. I'm not sure we would judge anybody just by that alone, but yeah. I don't know what it says about me that I like these mysteries. I love, I love solving stuff. I think we all kind of like mysteries because we always want to know why something happens, right? So. Can I buy your book? <laughs> <laughs> you can buy all of them. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.